Hi, everybody. It's a good evening tonight. Um, my name is Jennifer Roberts, and I'm president of the Graduate Community and Regional Planning Club. And we would like to welcome you to the second event in our social justice series, uh, Myths and Realities, A Plan for Transforming Cities. Before we begin, I have been asked to announce that Ambassador Luis, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce, she Debaca, okay, um, will be speaking on his work to stop human trafficking next Tuesday, March 6th at 8 p.m. in the sunroom, so right here. Uh, we would also like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the College of Design, the Community and Regional Planning Department, the Committee on Lectures, uh, funded by the government of the student body. We also encourage you to stay after the talk for the reception that will be over there. There's snacks and everything for everybody. Um, Jane, so moving on to our speaker, Jane Ramsey is the president of the Chicago-based Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, which combats poverty, racism, and anti-Semitism in partnership with the city's diverse communities. Under her leadership since 1979, JCUA, the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, has become one of Chicago's most influential organizations speaking on behalf of human and civil rights issues, including immigration, homelessness, and community displacement, community reinvestment, police misconduct, and government accountability. Jane Ramsey has served for two years as the Director of Community Relations for Chicago Mayor Harold Washington, she has also served as a board member for the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, the Chicago Co Coalition to Protect Public Housing, and the Public Welfare Coalition, and as the commissioner for the Private Industry Council and the Women's Commission of the City of Chicago. Ramsey has a master's degree from the University of Chicago, School of Administration, and a bachelor's degree in sociology from Washington University in St. Louis. Please join me in welcoming Jane Ramsey. Good evening. Thank you, Jennifer, um, for your warm welcome and introduction. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, and I, I especially appreciate the initiative and all of Jennifer's efforts since last fall to make my joining you um, this evening possible. The hospitality that I've been afforded by the university and by the community and regional planning students and faculty um, since I've arrived has been extraordinary. Um, I want to also thank Pat Miller, director of the lectures program, for all of your kind assistance. Um, I'm, um, I'm duly impressed already um, by um, Iowa State, and um, I so appreciate all of you for coming out and being with us tonight. Um, and we're here tonight to explore the myths and realities of homelessness and poverty through the lens of Chicago's supposed transformation of public housing. How fascinating that a path has been forged between Chicago and Iowa by some former residents of public housing and others who were forced out of the housing market as a result of the transformation. So let me begin with sharing with you my somewhat unique vantage point as this story unfolded. It began coincidentally for me as a University of Chicago graduate student in 1976 when I was placed as an intern with the City of Chicago's Economic Development Department, then called the Mayor's Committee for Economic and Cultural Development. Following my internship, I was hired on as a city planner, getting an invaluable first-hand education about Mayor Richard J. Daley and the Chicago machine. Truly, as a naive young woman, I wouldn't have believed Mike Royko's book called Boss if I hadn't observed the machinations firsthand. Well, those anecdotes are for other lectures, but one incident is relevant. As a city planner, I was assigned to work with the Industrial Council on Goose Island adjacent to the Cabrini Green housing development. 
A report came to my attention that was done by the Real Estate Research Corporation, who happened to be a friend of the mayor's, regarding Cabrini Green. It turns out that the companies in the area, coincidentally supporters and funders of the Chicago Machines campaign coffers, wanted to expand. The report recommended and described the process for tearing down the Cabrini Green housing developments. However, the report was too hot at the time and never saw the light of day. And I just want to reinforce this was in the 1970s. Sometime later, I left my job with the city and began working as an advocate with Cabrini Green residents who voiced concerns that the Chicago Housing Authority's plans to demolish Cabrini had more to do with the city's desire to obtain the valuable Gold Coast land than the CHA's public message regarding concern for the well-being of the residents. I wished then so much that I had taken with me a copy of that report which made the city's and CHA's intentions quite clear, exactly what the residents knew and feared. Which brings me to my primary context for acting as an advocate with public housing residents, well, truly as a critic, it will become evident, um, of the CHA's plan for transformation. In 1979, as Jennifer mentioned, I joined the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, or JCUA, where I have since worked. JCUA, a civil and human rights organization, was founded in 1964 to combat poverty, racism, and anti-Semitism in partnership with Chicago's diverse communities. With grassroots community organizations, JCUA organizes communities, builds coalitions, and educates and mobilizes the public regarding social and economic justice issues. High on its list is working with low income and minority communities on the issues of housing. In the 1960s, JCUA worked with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he moved to Chicago's West Side, bringing the civil rights movement north to challenge Chicago's housing and school segregation practices. JCUA placed a staff member with Dr. King to help organize his campaign to end the slums. In the 70s, JCUA filed suit as part of the Contract Buyers League to help African American homeowners who were wrongfully evicted and victimized by the illegal practices of redlining and panic peddling, as well as illegal yet morally corrupt contract sales. JCUA as well has and continues to work with community organizations fighting to preserve affordable housing in the face of gentrification and with others who are seeking fair housing in an end to racial steering of renters and buyers. Since 1990, JCUA has also employed a community development strategy partnering with nonprofit development corporations to build and preserve over 4,000 units of housing in Chicago for families and individuals with extremely low incomes. We have advocated with local, state, and national governments for housing subsidies and funding and have helped to create shelters, single room occupancy buildings, apartments, and some single family homes. We know housing, and we know how tight the market is for housing for very low income individuals and families. So when, in the 1990s, the Cabrini Green residents came to us with an urgent request to help save their public housing, we did not hesitate. Around the time the residents approached us, CHA had begun to engage resident leaders in drafting plans for their communities. That was good. They were in the process of doing so, had in fact just about completed the process, when in 1996 Congress changed Section 18 of the United States Housing Act to eliminate the requirement of one-for-one -one replacement housing. That provision had protected public housing residents by codifying that they could not be removed from their public housing unit until a comparable unit was available for them to move into, i.e. the one-for-one -one replacement. In 1996, when that provision was eliminated by Congress, locally, the CHA, under the control of Chicago's Mayor Richard M. Daley, pounced upon the opportunity to move forward with its long-desired demolition of Chicago's public housing. Shortly thereafter, I received an odd call from an official high up in the Midwest Regional Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, office. 
He asked me to meet with him and shared confidentially with me that he had met with city and CHA officials and that together they had agreed to a plan to take down Cabrini Green. He showed me the blueprints. The official also shared with me what he was willing to do for the residents and what the city's official had committed to doing. However, he feared they would not hold up their end of the plan, which was why he leaked the story to me. He knew very well JCUA's propensity for speaking out in the face of injustice and hoped that I would do something. I confronted him as to why he thought taking down hundreds of units of housing and displacing the families was okay. His response was telling and disturbing. What I'm about to share with you is absolutely true, though very hard, even today, for me to fathom. He responded that by taking down the public housing then, low-income residents 50 years hence would be living in better conditions and the immediate sacrifice of the current residents was worth that end goal. Can you get your head around that? I shared with him someone, um, and he was someone I knew to be wealthy and never in danger of being on the same streets he was so willing to risk for the residents, that I was more concerned about the current Cabrini residents than the hypothetical ones 50 years from that moment. That surreal meeting still amazes and infuriates me. Soon after, HUD issued a requirement that housing authorities across the country take down their high rises, over 100,000 nationally, 14,000 in Chicago. It soon became clear, however, that most or all of Chicago's existing public housing was at risk of being demolished, including the low rises in good condition, such as those at Lathrop Homes. Four years after the change in federal law, the CHA implemented the details of the plan for transformation. The plan included demolition beginning in the year 2000, not of 14,000 units, remember that that was what was required, but of 38,000 units, 38,000 units of public housing. CHA committed to building back within 10 years a total of 25,000 units of housing, an economic and physical impossibility to which they now admit. Meanwhile, the, law, the change law propelled the Cabrini Green residents to organize. They asked us at JCUA to help them conduct a press conference where they would voice their concerns and opposition, urging that the process already underway, which included public housing residents planning their own communities, be allowed to move forward. Following the press conference, which brought residents together from all across Chicago, the groups met to determine their future actions. As a result, that same day, the Coalition to Protect Public Housing was formed, joining together public housing residents who led the coalition with civil rights, community, and academic organizations, including my own. For the next several years, JCUA's role was to facilitate the growth and effectiveness of CPPH, Coalition to Protect Public Housing. It's quicker to say it that way. Um, and ultimately to help it stop the demolition without first replacing public housing in Chicago. The tactics CPPA, The tactics CPPH used were multiple. We filed and organized around a lawsuit and won the replacement of several hundred additional units of public housing, as well as the residents' right to manage the property. We testified at board meetings of the Chicago Housing Authority, urging them to put a moratorium on the demolition of public housing.
We held large-scale public meetings and rallies to educate the residents and the public. We sat with the media, newspapers, radio, and TV to get the story out from the residents' point of view into the press. We had an old-fashioned sit-in at HUD that importantly resulted in HUD's commitment to us that they would institute a relocation contract with each and every household displaced and plan for any resident prior to displacement. This has occurred, though problems with the relocations abound. As well, HUD committed to conducting a market survey of available affordable housing in Chicago and to forbidding CHA from proceeding with the de demolitions if the findings of the market survey showed that housing was not available. On this last point, it became clear which branch of government held the power and it wasn't the federal government. HUD did indeed conduct a market study and then refused to allow it to be released. Guess why? We and the community demanded HUD release their findings to no avail. Finally, the researchers leaked the story and HUD had to formally release it. Their findings were that Chicago had a deficit of 153,000 units too few for low-income families. Notwithstanding the findings and HUD's commitment to stop the demolitions, CHA nonetheless continued aggressively to demolish, unfazed by HUD, community concerns or residents' endangerment. We had to step up our pressure. The coalition pursued a human rights strategy International human rights law clearly identifies housing as a human right. The coalition wrote a letter to Mylun Kothari, then United Nations Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing, inviting him to meet with the residents in Chicago to hear their grievances regarding the displacements. To their credit and delight, Kathari accepted. He came to Chicago, met at Cabrini Green with the residents, and proceeded to issue findings which were shared with CHA and the mayor that the residents' grievances were correct and that their displacement was illegal according to the International Declaration of Human Rights to which the U.S. is a signer. As a result, the pace of the demolitions slowed. Today, all of the Cabrini high-rises have come down, which at its peak housed 15,000 people in 3,600 housing units. Left are the low-rises where CPPH chair and longtime activist Carol Steele lives. One of the gutsiest activists um, who I've had the pleasure to work with over many years. Though the CHA is trying to oust steel and the remaining residents to enable the creation at Cabrini of mixed income housing, steel has vowed to remain, I just spoke with her yesterday, even if filing a lawsuit is required to do so. The impact on residents who have had to move has been devastating. And Steele shared one story of a friend. And this is quoting Carol. Let me tell you about a woman I will call Mary, she said. Mary has eight children and was a former resident of Robert Taylor Homes. In 1966, she moved out of her unit because she was told that she could use a Section 8 voucher to get a better apartment somewhere else in the city. Yet she was not guaranteed a right to return once her unit was redeveloped. Since then, Mary and her family have moved at least 12 times because they cannot find safe, stable, secure housing. 12 times. 12 times. This is not an uncommon story. 12 times you move and then your kids are in, what, 12 different schools? And we know what those implications are. Mary is not alone. Many other residents who are awarded Section 8 vouchers are unable to find adequate apartments that meet the conditions of the voucher, and some who have found housing report that landlord discrimination is rampant. 
Other residents are not even given vouchers because they are deemed non-lease compliant because of drug-related arrests, outstanding um, bills of utilities, and other often minor factors. Other problems abound for the displaced residents, not the least of which is the loss of their community, extended families, and resources. The public really doesn't get this fact that public housing represents communities, many communities. People who live for a few years in them, people who have lived for decades. They have built communities. They may not look like our communities. They are and were communities. The public thinks of public housing solely as horrific places, yet for many it was home, their community where networks existed that were counted on for friendship, for family, for childcare help, extended credit, part-time jobs. Residents displaced taking Section 8 often fell victim as Mary did. Residents not taking Section 8 and thus retaining their right to return when and if public housing units were created were relocated temporarily to other housing developments, most often in communities as impoverished and segregated as the ones from which they came. Some were relocated to communities um, where there were rival gang members, endangering the families and making it very difficult for the youth to walk to school, necessitating that they cross rival gang lines. What kind of public policy is that? What kind of planning is that? Still other families who opted for the few mixed income units that have become available have found the social interactions strained. Though CHA was to track those relocating, they themselves recently stated and admit to having lost track of over 2,200 households if and when housing becomes available for any of these families, they cannot be reached to be informed that they may return. CHA today claims that the plan for transformation has been a great success and that they are 80% complete. However, many dispute these figures and we would join right in there. For example, the number of family units created seems to depend upon units created not as a result of the transformation plan. Remember, they, they set out where they were going to do units and what they were going to create back and build back. Um, um, but they appear to be counting units that were as a result of lawsuits that were filed. These were other developments. This is another whole set of numbers um, and should not be counted. Um, other numbers cited may be temporary private housing provided to CHA for their use, not new and not permanent CHA created units. It's, it's a shell game. Even the rosiest CHA figures admit that thousands of the anticipated 25,000 units projected by 2000, now by 2015, it was supposed to be 10 years, they asked for another five years, so now uh, the, the target is 2015, um, but they admit that they are not completed and given the budgetary challenges may never be. And if they are, if they are, if those 25,000 are completed, it is far short of the original 38,000 units and farther still from the demand for units with 80,000 families on CHA's current and now closed waiting list. Just last month, I was invited by the CHA to a stakeholders group of faith leaders to provide input for what the CHA is calling the Plan for Transformation 2.0. Too cute, too corporate. I was joined at the meeting by several ministers. We were asked to be frank and share some feedback for the newly installed head of CHA appointed by Chicago's new mayor, Rahm Emanuel. Woodyard seemed to forthright and articulate though most of his predecessors similarly have been good public figures who do what City Hall demands. The feedback we shared in part had to do with our concerns for CHA's lack of credibility in what it says and what it does. The director feigned being taken aback. I asked about the figures given for people relocated and was told that a full report could be found on CHA's website. I tried. Not so. 
as well. All of their numbers on the site are sketchy at best. So though I was trying to view the results with fresh eyes, I came away with my skepticism intact. The stories aren't all bleak. The Urban Institute reports to having interviewed many families from one of the developments who feel safer and healthier after their move and state, regardless of where they have moved, most families in our study are living in considerably better circumstances. However, the study also highlights the serious challenges that remain, most significantly residents' extremely poor health and persistently low rates of employment. Further, despite their improved quality of life, most CHA families continue to live in poor, predominantly African-American communities that offer limited access to economic and educational opportunity. Families like Charlene Jones and her three kids, who left the now torn down Ida B. Wells in 2005 and owns her own home in Roseland, says it has wrought positive outcomes. There are positive stories. Given that the plan for transformation is being held up as a model to the nation and one to be replicated, the harm inflicted upon many residents by the displacements and the mixed reviews by others should be of great concern to all of us. Before cities rush to replicate Chicago's experience, we hope that the negative impacts in experienced by many, as well as the sheer loss of affordable housing units, are taken carefully into account. As well, the positive, neutral, and negative impacts upon other communities, from those like South Suburban Harvey, with a majority of impoverished families, to Rogers Park on Chicago's north side, to Iowa City or Ames, are also part of the story. Concerns include the receptivity of the receiving communities where families who are or appear to be from public housing are judged in part on the basis of their appearance economic status, or cultural differences instead of their assets. These families, refugees from a city with 150,000, 153,000 too few units of affordable housing before 38,000 units of public housing were torn down. These families are seeking healthy communities, good schools, and jobs, just like the families already residing in these communities. Other issues remain to consider, such as who else benefits or is harmed by the transformation. Certainly many developers and other contractors have benefited. Millions of dollars in contracts were handed out to implement the demolition and redevelopments. As well, nonprofit agencies have benefited with contracts to be service providers. However, housing and other public projects not related to the plan for transformation have had less success due to the concentration of public and private resources to fund the plan. Notably, the MacArthur Foundation has been from the onset heavily tied into CHA and the success of the plan for transformation. It's invested in its success and it has been unfriendly to its critics. In fact, at the onset of the plan, MacArthur quite forthrightly and directly defunded all groups, including ours, <clears throat> found to be critical because they were critical. Creating the model for mixed income communities where the poor reside invisibly alongside more affluent families may be the centerpiece of the transformation plan. A limited number have resulted, but with little impact given the very small number of public housing residents who have been able to be accommodated. The Coalition to Protect Public Housing's rallying cry has been from the beginning, mix us in, don't mix us out, referring to the fact that around Cabrini, many beautiful improvements have been implemented as part of the plan, including a new school, fire and police departments, a grocery store, and other amenities. Unfortunately, the vast majority of Cabrini residents were not among those who could stay and benefit. Beautiful, yes, only not for them. 
Deconcentration has well occurred with a high price. The loss of the residents' communities, multiple residential and school moves, moves into dilapidated Section 8 units, and a lack of social interaction in the few mixed income communities. However, the positives that were reported likely are also in units where there has been a deconcentration such as that reported by Charlene Jones, who now lives with her children in a single family home. To conclude, it turns out that the plan for transformation embodied many myths and exacerbated homelessness. The plan has impacted thousands of residents of public housing, as well as thousands more families and individuals competing for scarce affordable housing. It has also resulted in some successful transitions for families who have been relocated into or found improved housing in healthier communities. It has enriched the coffers of developers and their contractors and supported numerous agencies. As well, the plan has cleared valuable land of notoriously blighted buildings, enhancing the value of existing neighborhoods and resulting in new housing for more affluent families. Some of the land cleared remains vacant, including the former sites of the vast Robert Taylor properties on the south side. And the market rate housing in many of the mixed income developments has not sold well. However, the media stories, politicians' claims of success, and foundation proclamations are consistent in their embrace of the plan's progress, even while the CHA's website and reports are grossly unreliable and incomplete. Some transformation chapters are yet unwritten as Lathrop and Cabrini low-rise housing residents battle to preserve what remains, the last hurrahs led by feisty, tenacious tenant leaders. The stakes are high for public housing and low-income residents across the country as policymakers judge the efficacy of Chicago's plan. Hopefully, their planning will be driven by the best interests of the most vulnerable in their communities and not clouded by political expediency or greed. My appeal to you is this. Our role as planners, sociologists, activists, community members is to be thoughtful, vigilant, rational, and resilient, and to ensure that the human right to housing and our prophetic obligation to seek justice are upheld in the creation of communities. We must do no less. Thank you. I believe there's a mic, so if you, if anyone wanted to start lighting up for uh, questions, if you have questions for the speaker at all, now would be a good time. Are there any questions? Hi, um, I teach here at the university. A lot of the students here are my students taking a class on history of the American city. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what an alternative model might have been. So for example, uh, in 1996 when section 18 is put in place, um, it sounds like um, your organization wanted to wait until there was, a one, there was some commitment for one-to-one. -one. So, the res you know, the financial resources and the time that it would take to do that seems, I think we would all agree, for 38,000 units, it's a, it's a lot. So what, in an alternate history, what's the, uh, what was the ideal for you guys that you're hoping for? There's not an ideal. But I, th I think an alternate history is that you don't tear housing down when you know that people are out there homeless. Um, the city did not have to tear down 38,000 units. The fiction is that these 38,000 units were dilapidated and unlivable. Not true. Many of them were in good shape. Um, as many of you know, the history of CHA and, uh, as an owner and manager um, has been a very um, um, poor one. They, from the very beginning, when the housing went up, 
uh, buildings were, the contracts were let, and they, uh, the builders made money from the very beginning um, using inferior materials. Fast forward to the many years of just corruption of the Chicago Housing Authority. Uh, the buildings were um, methodically emptied uh, in order to uh, allow them to deteriorate in, a, in, a, in order to allow CHA to um, get control of the, that housing. So that part of what CHA said was that a lot of those units were vacant, you know, and so we don't have to build back 38,000 because uh, many of those, the people um, aren't there anymore. But the, the reality was that many of the buildings um, were livable um, and uh, our belief and that of the broad, uh, housing community and agencies working with the communities was that it was exceedingly unwise to move aggressively to tear down those buildings. Even this, the, the federal government said you have to tear down 14,000 under the law. There's a big jump between the 14,000 and the 38,000 units. So we, none of us expected, and, and the city shouldn't have expected, the CHA shouldn't have expected that it was going to build back the housing, even if they're not looking at one-for-one one replacement, um, what, even what they said they were going to do, they have not come close to doing. So the uh, so that was the first thing that we really called for was a moratorium on the demolitions in the face of the market study. And again, it's not a it, it, it this isn't a best case scenario. Um, any of us would have loved to have seen people in good housing in their communities, not have to move out of their communities, but in good housing. But that wasn't the option. The option was for them to have housing and shelter in, the, in their communities. Um, and remember that they had been part of planning in each of the developments, they, they had been working for months to uh, help vision what the communities could look like. It was only when the um, the law passed changing the politics that enabled the city to much more aggressively say we don't have to wait for one for one replacement. We don't have to wait for those plans that they've been working on. We're just in the, for the best interest of the residents, the best interest of the residents, we're going to demolish the housing. We're going to give them vouchers to go out and find Section 8 housing knowing that that wasn't out there. You know, um, there have been many um, tactics used by the Chicago Housing Authority to, um, to empty the buildings. Um, and so it was, uh, we don't have a magic, I don't, I don't have a, um, uh, we don't have quick solutions. Um, what we did have was a sense of not exacerbating the homeless level and putting families at risk, crossing gang lines, doubling up, um, putting them on the streets. So I think that, that was the starting point. And then the next step was saying, then let's sit rationally and let's talk about. If a MacArthur Foundation, if a federal government, if the different um, arms of government, and public and private, we're going to put money into, into housing, let's do it in a rational way. Unfortunately, it was the, that other factors were at play that were not about the residents, um, that drove the um, pace and the determination to demolish. Um, so th that's really. Thanks. Hi. Um, so you mentioned you mentioned the relocation process and the CHA's handling of that. I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more depth. You said there were issues with gang violence and crossing lines and these sort of areas and you know invisible to some some people these invisible lines, but when they're crossed, they create issues. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. So well, first of all, when the CHA started to relocate people, they didn't track them. In fact, several years into the plan, they had to admit they had no idea where the residents were. And it was only with the threat of a lawsuit that they changed their practice and started to track 
where residents were. Um, so what happened is that they would, uh, the residents had two choices. They could take a Section 8 voucher and, and hopefully find housing um, with a, a private owner who would accept that. Um, but then they couldn't return if the housing was rebuilt. Um, and most residents, the CHA um, pushed residents to take vouchers. They, did, they wanted to limit the number who would have the right of return. Um, and they were, you know, they were intimidated into taking vouchers and all kinds of things. Anyway, so th the ones who did not take the vouchers were relocated into other public housing developments or buildings. Uh, unfortunately, many of them, there, was, there wasn't care taken to see if they were relocating a family who was, had been in an area where there was um, uh, one particular gang and putting them into a rival gang territory. That happened numerous times. Well, one can imagine, as we know, what, what does that mean for those families and for the, um, for the children who were placed in danger having to cross gang lines then every day, the rival gang lines every day um, to go to school. So the, um, the big story is that CHA did nothing about tracking relocation. Only when, only when threatened with a lawsuit did they begin to track relocation. Um, and that, um, that's predominantly the um, where we are today. <clears throat> and today they, um, as a result, they say they now have, they now know where everybody is. They told me in this meeting that we were at, said, well, I would love to see those figures. Where are those figures? Because we know this has been a big issue. They said, look on our website. That report is there. It's not there. I mean, it's like we don't have a brain. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, that's, uh, so they say now that they don't know where the 2,200 people, fam households are. So we know. Yep. Thank you. So I've, I've got a question. Um, I'm curious how, if you could explain a little bit more how you sort of came into your role as an activist, um, and also, you know, what keeps you going in this role? Ah. Well, what keeps me going are really the fabulous people who we work with in so many communities um, whose names aren't the ones that you open up and see in the magazines or on the newspapers, but they're passionate about their communities. They care about the justice um, and injustice, and they're you know from every African American and Latino and Muslim and Irish and you know it's in just so many different um, neighborhoods. Um, we're vibrantly um, working on issues of housing and jobs and schools. It's interesting. And it's um, it's been a privilege to be to work with so many passionate people who care and who have made a difference and made change in in the city and and, and elsewhere. Um, and so how I came into it is I was a I'm a child of that out of the '60s, uh, and I was uh, in, inspired by my family and others to uh, choose a path to create change. And at the time that I was looking, I had to get out of the city. I did, hadn't gone there intending to stay. I had gone there as a graduate student and I was a planner. And then as time went on, and that was, that was interesting, um, but as time went on and I was in the department that was supposed to create jobs and we were getting federal dollars that was, were going to the large corporations in Chicago. And it wasn't clear to me that the numbers that I was being told to put on the paper for the federal applications, the jobs we were creating, that was, didn't seem to be, from what I could see, true. So I pushed my boss. I said, but we could do this in order to really look at how do we create jobs? How can we support the small companies? How can we support, how can we really create? But the more that you push in that kind of environment, the less work you get. So I was getting less and less work, and it was clear it was time for me to go. And I um, looked for an organization that I felt would uh, ad work in grassroots communities and be about making change. 
and I just kind of tripped over the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs. I was interested as a Jew. I was interested in seeing what does my own faith have to do with my passion to do justice. And I just kind of lucked into it. Um, so it's been a great privilege. I've been executive director for most of the 32 years. I started as a organizer and just kind of worked my way up. Um, but so that's, that's how I got into it and yeah. Thank you. Um, you had spoken about uh, the 25,000 uh, units that are to be uh, replaced. Um, and you had said that the number was 38,000. What happened to the remainder, the 13,000? <clears> well, the CHA said they didn't have to build 38,000 because there were only 25,000 households at the time of demolition. Now, what about the 80,000 people, or at that point, 55,000 people on waiting lists? Um, so their math is, they, they chose the math. Um, that was what we said. You're taking down 38,000, put up 38,000. Um, and today we have 80,000 on the waiting list. So have you tracked or is anybody tracked um, that quantity of families and are they homeless? Are they presumed homeless? Well, so what, what and you guys know from your, from your um, um, work, many of you in communities, where are people who are on waiting lists? Mm -hmm. uh, they are doubled up. Some of them are homeless. They're in poor housing. Uh, some of them have left the state, as you guys know. Um, and then others, nobody knows. Yeah. Um, we, we were told, I will tell you this, when the demolition started, we met, a group of us met with the then city department um, of human resources, services. Um, and he at that point admitted that as the buildings were coming down, they were seeing more and more people in shelters from public housing. He wasn't supposed to say that. He was fired shortly thereafter. You know, the, the, the sad part of this is we are all here caring about what happens to people, and that's what we have to keep in mind. That is not what was driving this plan. It may have been what was driving some of the people on the line, good people working in the details of it, but the decision makers were not driven um, predominantly by the welfare of the residents. So is there any hope for Yeah, you guys. For that remainder? You guys, okay. you guys, you guys. You're the hope. You're the Ooh. hope. We there's a lot of housing. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. We have communities to build. We have yelling to do where there is if we see uh wrongful actions. Um, we have plans to come up with. You said, what are the plans? We have good plans to come up with. Um, how do we bring, you know, we talked earlier this evening about um, participation of, of communities and helping determine what their communities are going to look like. And as you work as planners or, as, or in whatever roles we work in, it, uh, um, that we remember to listen to the community. So as you go into your roles and train other people, um, we have to, um, I don't believe in being neutral. We have, to, we have to remember the values that we're coming out. We have to remember our obligation. Um, and I, you know, this isn't rhetorical. I mean, I, I, that's what people forget. Um, and it's hard. Um, and we have to call those who are in decision making, making wrongful decisions, or making, let's just, let's not even be judgmental. Let's just say they're making decisions that lead to people becoming homeless. Ah, bad decision. So how do we, you know, so what do we need to do? So today, so in Chicago, for example, we're, one of the things that we do is build, is work with, partner with not-for-profit development corporations. We've built about 4,000 units of housing for um, families under 20,000. Very low income. So this is pre preserving, rehabbing um, some construction. Um, that's something that we can do, and we do that in part public pu private partnership. So that we can do. Um, we can work for increased resources so that the, some of these federal, the programs that we've lost over the years, that start to build back. I hope. 
that we look at, at local, state, and federal levels to grow back those housing funds. Um, so I think there are a number of things um, we have to do. We talk about affordable housing, but I hear, as I hear people talk about affordable housing, sometimes it's that upper echelon. I hope we remember to remember the very low income so that when we talk about aff affordable is good, for, um, but let's talk about those who are most endangered. Um, and that's, that's difficult. Um, so I, I, I think, a, a, you know, looking at public policies, looking at resources, engaging the private sector, holding our government officials accountable. There's a lot we can do. Um, and we each have to do a piece of it. We need you. Hi, I'm Aja Holmes, and I went to Josephinum High School, which is on North Avenue and Division, uh, not that far from Cabrini yeah. Green. And my dad also works for the city of Chicago, and he had numerous times talked about a plan that the mayor had, the six-mile radius of downtown being revitalized and um, it also being rebuilt and things of that nature. Did, I know that Cabrini Green falls within that six miles of, of downtown. I think the, the zero zero latitude states and I forget the cross street. State and Madison. Yes, yeah, state and Madison in terms of six mile radius from there. Can you talk about the impact and just the amount of volume that of the condominiums and lofts that went up um, and did or were some of those areas within that six mile radius um, also have some of the replacement housing that you had spoke of? There, were there hmm. vouchers within that six mile radius were able to be used? Um, sure, I mean the vouchers can be used wherever. It can be, uh, someone will accept the voucher. The replacement housing has happened in, in scattered uh, with much of it within a six mile radius. But most of that is not for families. Okay. Most of the replacement housing that's happened has been for seniors. Oh. So the numbers, um, um, but as you, re as you know, many of the demolitions were families. Yes. So the big story here is that very, um, uh, just a fraction of, even when we're at the end of the plan, mm -hmm. Um, a f just a fraction of families will be covered. Um, and presumably, so what does that mean? That means that we've made a choice as a, as a, as a city that we're just not, we're not going to be able to house the families. And, and in terms of the numbers for the senior citizens, it seems that most of the senior citizens aren't folks of color either. Well, they're, they're they're, no, they're, they're, it's mixed, it's mixed. You know, there's certainly seniors of color and, and um, you know, so the, the senior housing is scattered all over the city. Um, you know, the replacement housing, some of it has happened on the west side, some on the north side, um, but very, but really at this point still just a fraction. And, um, and that's what I was disturbed. I was almost unhappy you know, with myself. I, you know, I keep hearing these numbers. We, we're so far, and I'm thinking, what am I missing? And I want to make sure I'm diligent. I don't want to come here and tell you that this is all glum, you know, and, that, and that there's really all this great housing for family, and I just haven't seen it. So I called around to some of my allies and said, what, what am I missing? Because I'm hearing this. The CA, I was in this meeting. The CHA said, we've got this. We're now at Plan for Transformation 2.0, and, uh, and this is great. Uh, and so that's why I was trying to get my head around what numbers are they counting. So there have been some replacements. There are not many. They've got uh, a long way to go. And when they get to the 25,000, that's 13,000 less than the 38,000, which wasn't enough. Um, the other thing that's happening, we talked about earlier gentrification in the, in, in almost every neighborhood in the city. Um, so it's just, uh, um, sometimes we don't have answers. And sometimes we have to kind of accept we don't have answers, but let's not do harm. Let's wait for good answers before we do harm. And we did harm. Thank you. Um, I would first of all like to thank Jane Ramsey um, for coming. Uh, 
truly inspiring, truly courageous, and diligent in your work. And it does. It takes a lot of courage to start a discussion about these issues rather than just letting them lie. So we wanted to thank you. We appreciate your coming. And hopefully uh, our generation, our uh, next movement will come from a place of courage in starting these kinds of discussions. I'm sure they will. And let me, let me thank you all for coming here and listening. And um, I'm inspired by the fact that of your commitments to, um, to act in this field and, um, and as planners and whatnot. Uh, I would also like to thank our co-sponsors for making this event possible and thank you all for attending and feel free to stay with the reception for this reception. We have snacks, everything. Thank you again.